Okay, quick show of hands. This is not supposed to be a trick question. How many of you in this room would say, I consider myself a Christian leader? Come on, raise your hands up high like you really mean it. All right, let me put it this way. How many of you would say, I consider myself to be a leader in Jesus' church right now? Go ahead and, and place your hand up high. All right, you'll see that today what we're doing is we're basically wrapping up a sermon series that we started six weeks ago when we launched our Sunday morning services, describing Two Cities Church. What we did in the first two weeks is basically explain to you who we are, and the last four weeks we've been explaining to you what we're doing. And everything in that go deep banner that you see when you're walking in the door is designed to get you to this step today. We're trying to explain to you what it means to be a leader. And whether you know it or not, I teach leadership. I teach it at the seminary, at the doctoral level, at the PhD level in North Carolina. And when I start a leadership course every semester that I'm teaching leadership, I show a video. I'm going to show you guys that video today. Now, you just need to know, this is a TED Talk by a Canadian guy by the name of Drew Dudley, and this is a six minute and 12 second video, which I never, ever give up six minutes of a sermon to watch a video. But this video is so important that I want you to see the entire thing. I want you to see how Drew Dudley describes leadership. I want you to see what Drew Dudley calls everyday leadership. Y'all watch the screen. I want to just start by asking everyone in the audience here a question. How many of you are completely comfortable with calling yourselves a leader? See, I ask that question all the way across the country, and everywhere I ask it, no matter where, there's always a huge portion of the audience that won't put up their hand. And I've come to realize that we have made leadership into something bigger than us. We made it into something beyond us. We made it about changing the world. And we take this title of leader and we treat it as if it's something that one day we're going to deserve. But to give it to ourselves right now means a level of arrogance or cockiness that we're not comfortable with. And I worry sometimes that we spend so much time celebrating amazing things that hardly anybody can do that we convince ourselves that those are the only things we're celebrating. And we start to devalue the things that we can do every day. We start to take moments where we truly are a leader and we don't let ourselves take credit for it and we don't let ourselves feel good about it. And I've been lucky enough over the last 10 years to work with some amazing people who have helped me redefine leadership in a way that I think has made me happy. With my short time today, I just want to share with you the one story that is probably most responsible for that redefinition. I went to a school, in a little school from Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. And on my last day there, a girl came up to me and she said, I remember the first time that I met you. And then she told me a story that happened four years earlier. She said, on the day before I started university, I was in a hotel room with my mom and my dad. And I was so scared and so convinced that I couldn't do this, that I wasn't ready for university, that I just burst into tears. And my mom and my dad were amazing. They were like, look, we know you're scared, but let's just go tomorrow. Let's go to the first day. And if at any point you feel as if you can't do this, that's fine. Just tell us and we'll take you home. We love you no matter what. And she said, so I went the next day and I was standing in line getting ready for registration. And I looked around and I just knew I couldn't do it. I knew I wasn't ready. I knew I had to quit. And she said, I made that decision. And as soon as I made it, there was this incredible feeling of peace that came over me. And I turned to my mom and my dad to tell them that we needed to go home. And just at that moment, you came out of the student union building wearing the stupidest hat I have ever seen in my life. It was awesome. And you had a big sign uh, for morning Shiner M, which is Students Fighting Cystic Fibrosis, a charity I've worked with for years. And you had a bucket full of lollipops. And you were walking along and you were handing the lollipops out to people in line and talking about Shiner M. And all of a sudden, you got to me and you just stopped and you stared. It was creepy. <laughs> This girl right here knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then you looked at the guy next to me, and you smiled, and you reached in your bucket, you pulled out a lollipop, and you held it out to him. And you said, you need to give a lollipop to the beautiful woman standing next to you. And she said, I have never seen anyone get more embarrassed faster in my life. He turned beet red. He wouldn't even look at me. He just kind of held the lollipop out like this. <laughs> and I felt so bad for this dude that I took the lollipop. And as soon as I did, you got this incredibly severe look on your face, and you looked at my mom and my dad, and you said, Look at that. Look at that. First day away from home, and already she's taking candy from a stranger. 
And she said, everybody lost it. 20 feet in every direction, everyone started to howl. And I know this is cheesy, and I don't know why I'm telling you this, but in that moment when everyone was laughing, I knew that I shouldn't quit. I knew that I was where I was supposed to be, and I knew that I was home. And I haven't spoken to you once in the four years since that day, but I heard that you were leaving. And I had to come up and tell you that you've been an incredibly important person in my life, and I'm going to miss you. Good luck. And she walks away, and I'm flat. And she gets about six feet away, she turns around and smiles and goes, you should probably know this too. I'm still dating that guy four years later. <laughs> a year and a half after I moved to Toronto, I got an invitation to their wedding. Here's the kicker, I don't remember that. I have no recollection of that moment, and I've searched my memory banks to think that is funny, and I should remember doing it, and I don't remember it. And that was such an eye-opening, transformative moment for me to think that the, maybe the biggest impact I ever had on anyone's life a moment that had a woman walk up to a stranger four years later and say, you've been an incredibly important person in my life, was a moment that I could not even remember. How many of you guys have a lollipop moment? A moment where someone said something or did something that you feel fundamentally made your life better? All right. How many of you told that person they didn't? See, why not? We celebrate birthdays where all you have to do is not die for 365 days. <laughs> And yet we let people who have made our lives better walk around without knowing it. And every single one of you, every single one of you has been the catalyst for a lollipop moment. You have made someone's life better by something that you said or that you did. And if you think you have it, think about all the hands that didn't go back up when I asked that question. You're just one of the people who hasn't been told. But it is so scary to think of ourselves as that powerful. It can be frightening to think that we can matter that much to other people. Because as long as we make leadership something bigger than us, as long as we keep leadership something beyond us, as long as we make it about changing the world, we give ourselves an excuse not to expect it every day from ourselves and from each other. Marianne Williamson said, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that frightens us. And my call to action today is that we need to get over that. We need to get over our fear of how extraordinarily powerful we can be in each other's lives. We need to get over it so we can move beyond it. And our little brothers and our little sisters, and one day our kids, or our kids right now, can watch us start to value the impact we can have on each other's lives more than money and power and titles and influence. We need to redefine leadership as being about lollipop moments. How many of them we create, how many of them we acknowledge, how many of them we pay for, and how many of them we say thank you for. Because we make leadership about changing the world, and there is no world. There's only six billion understandings of it. And if you change one person's understanding of it, one person's understanding of what they're capable of, one person's understanding of how much people care about them, one person's understanding of how powerful an agent for change they can be in this world, you change the whole thing. And if we can change, understand leadership like that, I think if we can redefine leadership like that, I think we can change everything. And it's a simple idea but I don't think it's a small one. And I want to thank you all so much for letting me share it with you today. I like this video because I think Drew Dudley has put his finger on a problem in the church. You see, we tend to have this idea of leadership and we think about a leader as like the president of Columbus State University or the CEO of AFLAC or the chief of staff of the army. No question those guys and gals are leaders. But we tended to make leadership just about that. And when we, when we made leadership at that level and only at that level, we took leadership away from everybody in this room who can have a profound impact. Think about this for just a second. Drew Dudley probably had the biggest impact of any human being on this woman who was ready to quit university before it even started. And he never even knew it. Except for four years later, she grabbed him and explained to him, I finished school and I got married because of a very simple thing that you did a long time ago. See, I think we have a bad definition of leadership in the church. And what I hope to do today is to, like Drew Dudley, redefine leadership for you. In fact, I'm just going to try to make it really, really simple for you. Leadership for us is just simply using the influence that God has already given you, letting the Holy Spirit work through you to influence or impact somebody else in their faith. How many of you in this room say, I can do that? I'm serious, come on y'all. Just simply allowing the Holy Spirit to do something this subtle through you to influence or impact another person's faith. Here's what we mean by the word leadership. What we're really trying to set out to do as a church is to turn everyone in this room 
into a leader at some level. Because I really believe the essence of the New Testament says it this way. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been made into a leader. It's it comes with the territory. And what we're going to do for just a second is we're going to go look at a couple of places in the New Testament that I think are really, really important about leadership. And what I hope that by the time you leave here, you're convinced. I, because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, he has also made me into a leader. And with whatever influence, as small as this might be, with whatever influence that he's giving me, I'm going to use it to try to impact other people's faith. So a couple of things that I want you to hear today, part of understanding what it means to be a leader is a leader is the kind of person, man or woman, who is going to take responsibility. When Jesus left heaven and came to earth, he came on a mission. In fact, he makes it very clear in the Gospels, the reason that I've come is because my father sent me and he sent me to do a thing to accomplish a thing. When Jesus leaves earth and goes back to heaven, this is what we would call the first birthday, the first day of the church. He hands his mission off to his church. And then he expects his church to take responsibility and accomplish that mission. This is found at the end of Matthew. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 28. Scroll all the way down to the very end of the book of Matthew in your Bible. And you're going to hear Jesus' famous words. These words have been referred to as the Great Commission. That doesn't come up here on the screen. But this is Jesus handing his mission off to his church. By the way, we learned this very, uh, we're very aware of this in this room. The church is not a building. It's the people that are in the building. So when Jesus handed this mission off, he handed it to me, and he handed it to you. Here's what Matthew chapter 28 says. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me on heaven, given to me in heaven and on earth. Authority is a leadership word. Now listen to what he does with that authority. He hands it to us. He says, Go therefore and make disciples. If you're in the habit of underlining or highlighting in your Bible, you need to highlight those two words, make disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here's something that I really need you to understand. I need you to uh, pay uh, close attention to because we have got this thing so far off track that you can, you can miss it. When Jesus left heaven and left earth to go back to heaven, he established his church. Look up here for just a second and listen carefully to what I'm going to say because this is extremely important to who we are. Jesus doesn't really have a mission for his church. It wasn't like he gave his church something to do now that he's leaving. Jesus has a church for his mission. The whole reason that he called his church together and commissioned them in the Great Commission was to hand his mission that God gave him off to us. Amen. And now he expects us to take that responsibility and to do something with it. Now, I need you to understand the phrase make disciples up here because the whole Great Commission hinges on these two words. These are not words that we use in our vocabulary very often, especially if you don't go to church. Most people don't have the first clue. What does that word disciple mean? Let me define it for you very clear or very quickly. In Jesus' day, you had a lot of master craftsmen. And a master craftsman would take a, an apprentice on and start to teach a trade to the apprentice. Rabbis did this with young men who were learning ministry. The master craftsman of Jesus' day did this. When you took a, an apprentice on and started to teach them the skills, you took a disciple. You were making a disciple. And essentially what Jesus is saying is, take what I've taught you, and live it out, and live it out in such a way that you take it and you teach it to somebody else and they live it out, and you just keep doing that until there's nobody else left to make a disciple of. 
Two Cities Church, would you listen to what I'm going to say? God has an important role, a great place for you in his great commission. It's for everyone in this room. It's not just for a select few. And what he's asking you to do is take that responsibility, take that leadership, and do something with it. I've got a quote I'm going to show you on the screen. In fact, I hit it too early. From the oldest written letter, in, to the oldest written Christian letter outside of the New Testament. Most of you are aware that a bunch of our New Testament books are actually letters written back and forth. Peter took what Jesus taught him, and he went to Rome, and he ran into a guy by the name of Clement. And Peter taught Clement what Jesus taught him. Peter made Clement his disciple, just like Peter was a disciple of Jesus. <clears throat> Clement writes a letter. This is the oldest letter. In fact, Clement is really one of the first leaders of the Christian church after the apostles all die away. Clement is living in Rome. He doesn't have a last name, so we just call him Clement of Rome. And he wrote a letter, and the title of this portion of his letter is that Jesus Christ, our leader, and we are his soldiers. Here's what I'm trying to explain to you. Peter got this directly from Jesus. Clement got this directly from Peter. If you want to know what Jesus was teaching, what Jesus' followers were hearing from him, the best place to go to outside of the New Testament is this guy's letter. Listen to what Clement learned about leadership from Peter. He learned this. In this letter, he said, Let us then, he's talking to all Christians, let us then with all energy act the part of soldiers in accordance with his, I put the word Jesus in parentheses because he's talking to Christians about Jesus, in accordance with his holy commandments. Basically, he's saying all of us have a responsibility. We need to take that responsibility. But if you want to know exactly what Clement has in mind about leadership, listen to what he says next. He says, all are not prefects. These are high-ranking leaders. Nor commanders of thousands, nor of hundreds, nor of fifty, or the, nor the like. But each one, in his own rank, performs the things commanded by our king. Clement is saying, some of you in this room may lead fifty people. Some of you in this room may, day, may one day lead a thousand. But everyone in this room can do this. That's what Clement is saying. All of us in this room have a great part to play in the Great Commission. We're not asking you to become a martyr or a missionary, though that may be what Jesus asks of you one day in the future. We're just asking you to simply influence the people around you. Impact them with your faith. Now let me tell you how we want you to do this. For us, this happens first and foremost. In other words, the majority of our time and energy on this thing happens in our life groups. That's why getting you involved in a life group is so important. That's why you inviting people to a life group is so important. Right now, we're under the beta phase of developing our church's mobile app. And when our mobile app is ready, each week, we'll produce some discussion questions. Anybody who's gone to the sermon can gather a three or five people around you and just simply ask a question that's already pre-formatted for you on the mobile app and simply wait to hear their response. And then ask another question and wait and ask another question. Wait, you, you don't have to even know what you're talking about to do that, right? And our goal, listen, is that half of the people that are coming to this life group. Maybe you're meeting in a coffee shop, maybe you're meeting at a restaurant, maybe you're meeting at a park in or in a, on a weekday afternoon, maybe you're meeting in a home. But our goal is that 50% of the people that are in that group don't really go to church and not necessarily believe, don't necessarily believe in God. And they're starting to listen to you and to other people as you discuss what you've heard in this room. And I promise you, that will leave an impact longer than four years from now. That will leave an impact for eternity. Everybody in this room could do that.
You could just bring three or five people around you, read some questions and pause and let them answer those questions. This is part of fulfilling, doing our part, our great role in the Great Commission. Second thing that I want you to see from the Bible today is that not only do we have an or a responsibility, but God also gives us this incredible opportunity. Now, I'm going to read for you what I think is probably one of the most significant passages in the Bible on leadership. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's actually one verse, seven words, very, very small, but very, very powerful. But let me... Let me ask you to think about leadership in these terms. Imagine that you're starting CSU this year for the first time. You're a freshman at CSU. And you got a little brother who's about to finish high school. He's still a senior in high school. And he's going to follow you to CSU. And he asks you some questions about what college is like. Now, certainly, you don't have all of the answers. You're only a few months into this thing, this school year. But how many of you in this room could answer a lot of your little brother's questions or your little sister's questions when they're still a senior in high school and they're getting ready to start CSU in the fall? And they're asking you, hey, can you tell me what it's like? Uh, how many of you think you can answer a lot of their questions? You may not be able to answer all of their questions. In fact, you probably don't have the answer to all of the questions. But you do know a little bit because you're doing it. And I want you to think about leadership today like big brother, big sister leadership. I'm not there yet. I've still got a lot of stuff that I need to figure out, but I know a few things, and I'd be happy to share the few things that I know with you. That's the kind of leadership that the great Apostle Paul in the New Testament had when he wrote this letter to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, seven very very powerful words. He says it this way, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Now, you should understand that what he's saying is every follower of Jesus, that's what he's saying in this verse, is called to influence others, which means every follower starts to become a leader. Y'all, I can't tell you the number of Christians that I've met who when I start to ask them to take a little bit of responsibility, to start to influence other people, they, they start to immediately say, well, Jeff, I'm ashamed to say it, but you need to know that there's a few things in my life that are just not right right now. And I don't know that I, I should be doing that because there's some stuff in my life that I just need to get right to. And I try to say to them, you know what? Join the club. There's some stuff in my life that's just not right right now, too. It's okay. But if you know anything about the Bible, y'all, if you have read the book of 1 Corinthians, you know this is the most jacked up church in the New Testament by far. I mean, all of the stuff that you could do wrong, they were doing wrong. And I'm pretty sure they made up some stuff. They invented some stuff at this church that was jacked up. So when Paul writes this letter, it blows my mind that he's saying to them, you too can lead, and you certainly don't have to have it all figured out. In fact, you probably have a lot of junk in your life that still needs to get straightened out, but don't let that stop you from leading. He's asking this really messed up church to take the responsibility, and then God's going to give you some opportunities. And when he does that, here's what he says, just Follow my example. Just do it like I'm doing. It's big brother, big sister kind of leadership language. You don't have to figure it all out. Just, I'm still working on it, but I, I've learned a thing or two along the way, and I'd be happy to share with you the thing or two that I've learned along the way. We're going to, as a church, make disciples through multiplication. Chris and Rebecca, you want to come up here on the stage? When we say make disciples through multiplication, really what we're saying is that Christians should be making disciples of other Christians. Y'all go ahead and join me up here, please. And we're doing this, making disciples, because God made us a disciple, so we're imitating Christ, and we want others to imitate us. This is disciples making disciples. We're doing it in life groups. The first step in our going deep, we're, we're doing life together. And what we're trying to get to as a church is life groups 
making more life groups. Anybody want to take a guess at what is the one thing that you need in order for one life group to become two life groups? What's the thing that you need? You need a leader. If you don't have a leader, it doesn't matter if you have 50 people showing up to a life group together. By the way, that's not a whole lot of doing life together. Now it's basically a small church. But without a leader, you can't go from one group to two groups. We're talking about ministries, making more ministries. But we're so serious about this. Y'all pay attention for just a second. We're talking about churches, making more churches, until everyone in the Chattanooga Valley, until everyone on planet Earth has heard about Jesus. Some of you who have been with us in, as part of the core team when we started this thing back in the summer, you've heard this already, but for the rest of our church, I need you to understand how serious we are about this. Chris and Rebecca Poirier left North Carolina to move to Columbus for the purposes of starting a church. Their church has already incorporated, and that's the name of their church right there on the screens. I'm going to ask them a question or two just so that you guys will get a chance to meet them. But I'll just tell you straight up what we said uh, to our core team this summer when we started having this discussion. Any pastor, any church that does this right now is either insane, because that means some of you are going to leave and you're going to take people and money and resources and volunteers and all of that stuff with you to go start River Valley Church. Either you're insane or you're really, really serious about making leaders. So Chris, Rebecca, I just want you guys for just a second to explain to them what you were doing in North Carolina when you really felt the call of God to bring you guys down here to Columbus, Georgia. And by the way, be very brief, will you? Because we're going to run out of time because of that six-minute, 12-second video. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> you just asked me. Give a preacher a microphone and ask him to be short. And that's the story. We'll fill you in afterwards. Thanks, everyone. No, um, so the short version of the story is that I had finished up seminary for my Master of Divinity at Southeastern in Wake Forest in 2017. My focus was church planting. And we were starting to figure out what exactly we were going to focus on, whether God was calling us to stay in Raleigh-Durham and plant in the urban center there, or if we needed to open up our aperture a little bit. Because what happens when a bunch of human beings you know, think we have an idea of what we want to do with our lives? Um, the, if you're a Christian, you've heard this joke before. If you have plans and you tell them to God, God's going to be like, <laughs> no, I have plans to no. Um, so it was about that time that we finally said, we did the thing that's really hard for a bunch of Christians, and for those of you that have been to church every now and then have probably heard this statement, a uh, pastor say, one of the most powerful things you can do with your life and ministry is to give God your yes, literally write a blank check and hand it over and say, fill out the two line and tell me where I'm going. That's not easy, y'all, so don't, under don't <laughs> say that I'm so amazing that I did this. It's We had finally hit a point that we weren't sure what was next, and we were like, God, what is next? And about a week later, I get a text from some dude named Jeff from South Georgia that wanted to meet me for some reason because he pulled my resume out of a pile at the ministry office at Southeastern. And I was like, sure, Jeff from South Georgia, I will meet you. And I told Rebecca, I was like, I'm going to go meet a guy, see if God's opening some doors. And I was like, but I don't know anybody from South Georgia, I don't think. And then we kind of started figuring it out. And when I walked through the door, he walks out, you know, Jeff is very unassuming, and he goes, hi, I'm Jeff. And I was like, I know who you are. I met you a few years ago. Now it's almost seven years ago when I started at Southeastern pitching a residency of becoming a leader where he was like everyone you talked to then was like, you were like, come to the Chattahoochee Valley. And I was like, bro, I just got here. <laughs> Um, my wife will murder me because we had just left Washington, D.C. in two full-time careers as federal employees to begin our ministry. And then almost five years later, God did the exact same thing, except we were leaving our comfort of Raleigh. Rebecca's from Raleigh, our family. Part of our family is there. And he's like, as soon as I saw him, I was like, South Georgia. And he's like, yeah, why? And I was like, because I've heard this pitch. That's what I wanted to get to next Chris, you just uh, set the ball up perfectly, teed the ball up for me. You guys had, uh, Rebecca, you had a good paying job. She's a CPA and had a great uh, paying job. You guys had family and you had stability in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. 
why on earth would you pick up and move to the Chattahoochee Valley knowing no one here? And this is for either one of you too. What thought, thoughts, here's sir? the question. What can... ultimately prompted you guys to say, okay, I guess we're going to the Chattahoochee Valley? Um, I think for me it was just the point of, I, I had just gotten to the point of, okay, God, everything that we're, we're trying here, um, you know, isn't working, and we were kind of getting into the, either we're going to dig in our heels and become very comfortable where we are and make zero impact, or we need to consider that you're calling us um, out of this area somewhere else. Um, so when when Chris had gotten, uh, had the conversation with Jeff, I guess at a coffee shop or something. No, at Southeastern. Oh, was it at Southeastern? Yep. Okay. Um, I don't know. God just did a, a tremendous work in my heart, and I went from, I, I was probably this close to saying, no, absolutely not. I'm not moving. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> to, you know, a military town in uh, South Georgia. It's hot enough in North Carolina. We're fine here. And instead, the words that came out of my mouth were, let's consider this um, as possibly God's direction for us. Um, and so then it just kind of went from there. Yeah, it very much became a, you know, we have to do this. And even I was surprised. I was like, we do? And that became the underpinning. And soon after that, we had gone through the process, multiple interviews, and had come to Columbus. And seeing Columbus, we just felt the Holy Spirit say, we can do this. This city makes sense. Um, Raleigh, Durham is one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the U.S., but at the same time, it has a great seminary in its backyard, a handful of amazing churches that it didn't seem like we needed to stay put. I mean, to put it in context, I told some of you when you first met me that I'm an absolute geek, I'm a total nerd. I was managing a comic shop. I was, uh, as they say, living the dream in part of the way, but that wasn't what God called me to do. So I still get to read comics and have fun with them, but I, I just say that to put the context in that, again, we had found our new normal, something that was comfortable, and God was like, nope, got to take that snow globe and shake it a little bit, <laughs> but for an absolutely good reason. Let me tell you about this lollipop moment that neither Chris nor uh, Chris or Rebecca or I could possibly imagine. I sent a random text. It was this, um, this succinct, hey, my name is Jeff, would love to talk to you about coming to South Georgia, and Chris answered the text. We set up a meeting. And then God stepped in and took care of everything after that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for Chris and Rebecca in just a second. But I want you guys to hear this. Our plan as a church is to plant more churches. Chris's plan is to start a church that will plant more churches in the Chattahoochee Valley until there are churches that are reaching the entire Chattahoochee Valley. And y'all, right now, 75 to 80% of our community does not go to church. Many of them do not know Christ, which means we need a lot more churches. For some of you out there, maybe God will one day move you in this direction. For others of you, maybe it's you're starting a ministry. Maybe it's you're in a life group and you're stepping away to start a life group. But for everybody in this room, you can influence somebody else and have this lollipop moment on another person in our community. Let's say a prayer for these two and Pray that God will put everything in place they need to be wildly successful in the future. Father, thank you for causing Chris and Rebecca to feel your spirit calling them to the Chattahoochee Valley. And God, now as we continue to talk and as we prepare, as he, they prepare for their future and we prepare for their departure, we know that you're going to do great things through them. And God, it's insane for a church that's six weeks old to get ready to send out people to start another church. But we're this serious about accomplishing your mission and following you. And I thank you for calling a couple like Chris and Rebecca to be this serious about it as well. Bless them and put all of the things that they need in place for them to launch River Valley Church in the near future. Amen. Thanks, you guys, for joining us. Give them a hand, will you? thing that I want you to hear from me is part of becoming a leader causes you. You benefit from it. A lot of being a leader and having this lollipop moment, it's for other people. 
But part of it is for you. It's for your growth. It's for your maturity. I'm going to have, I'll tell you a quick story. We're going to look at another passage of scripture and then we'll, we'll, after we're done with this sermon, we're going to have the Lord's Supper. We'll do some communion together as a church family. But I was on a mission trip a few years ago. We were, we took a bunch of doctors and nurses to the Caribbean and we were treating people that had no access to dentistry, no, no access to medicine. And the doctors and nurses were taking care of lots of people, dentists and their assistants were taking care of lots of people inside this little shack on the side of a mountain. A couple of folks that showed up on this mission trip had no real medical experience. And our goal was for them to engage children, engage adults and parents while they were waiting in line to get their teeth fixed or to get treated by the doctors. So I'm over here on the other side of this field talking to a bunch of guys because in this culture, for whatever reason, the guys all go to one side of the field, the ladies all go to another side of the field. So I'm over here with an interpreter talking to the guys that are on this side of the field. There's a couple of folks from our church that are on this mission trip that are over on the other side of the field playing games with the kids, but not talking to the ladies. So I sent the interpreter over to go talk to these ladies from our church, and I said, would you tell those ladies to go over there and start to engage the women that are standing in line waiting to be seen? Would you ask them to start sharing their faith, and just simply talking about Jesus with them. True story. Interpreter goes over there, has a little conversation, comes right back with this weird look on their face, and the interpreter says to me, uh, they said, that's not our job, that's your job. You come over and talk to these ladies if you want somebody to talk to them about Jesus. And I cannot tell you how many times subtly I think church people have slipped into this perspective. Hey, you are the paid professional up there on stage. You do that. That's the leadership that you do. But I don't do that. I just simply live out my faith. And if other people get it, great. If they don't, it's okay with me. And I don't think that these ladies understood the power that they could have. So I kind of went over there and had the conversation with these ladies um, discreetly and said, no, 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 the reason you're here is to have this lollipop kind of leadership on people that are standing in line waiting to get their teeth pulled or waiting to get some medical care. By the way, this is probably a good time to say this. Y'all need to hear this from me. Since this church started, since we founded back in July of last year, I have not taken a penny of compensation from this church. We're not in a place where I can take a penny of compensation. Everything that I've done is totally free. So the idea that there's a paid professional up on stage, well, I can just answer that one for you right now. Nobody's getting paid for this right now. And the idea that there's a professional up on stage, that the professional does that, and I don't do that, that's a really, really bad, listen to me, an unbiblical idea. And I just believe pastors sometimes allow this unbiblical idea to get in people's minds. Because let me tell you how the Bible describes people doing ministry. Ephesians chapter 4. I like to point this out to pastors because some of them, when they read it, it appears to me they don't understand their role. Ephesians chapter 4 describes leadership in the church. And here's what it says. It says, and he himself, speaking of Jesus, gave some, he's talking about to the church, he gave some people to be apostles, and some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Many people put those together. Pastor is a teacher, and if you're a teacher, maybe God is calling you to pastor one day. Verse 11, the first, the first part of that passage says, this is the people that God has given to his church. Pay close attention to what verse 12 says, what the, the passage says next. This is why God gave those people to the church. Equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. 
I hope this is hitting home for you. What is the standard that church people are striving for? It's the standard that Christ set when he lived on planet Earth. And because that's the goal that we're aiming towards, all of us have a lot to work on. However, if you've been lulled into or unfortunately distorted into the view that I'm not a pastor, so I'm not a leader, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12 directly says, oh yes you are. In fact, the leader isn't really doing the leadership that they're supposed to do for the good of the church. Listen to me y'all. For the glory of God and for the growth of his people. If the leader isn't turning away, turning over all of the ministry of the church to the people of the church. It actually says that as you start to do ministry, the church grows more mature. You grow more mature. Everybody is better when everybody is leading. When just one person is on the stage leading, it's not good, y'all. And I kind of think about it this way. When I talk to some pastors, what it really feels like to me is they're just trying to get you in the door and get you busy and keep you doing stuff for the church until you die. That's really what they're trying to do with no real goal, not trying to get you to a place where you're ready to leave. You know what this feels like for me? What a lot of churches feel like, they're getting you in the door and they're running you as hard as you can and then ultimately you fall over dead. Here's what this feels like to me when churches do that. It feels an awful lot like a hamster on a wheel just running as hard as he can in church till he falls off the wheel and dies. And I'm just going to say it this way. Those pastors that keep all of the leadership for themselves, and listen to me, y'all, won't allow you the ability to lead. There's one of two things wrong with these people, these pastors. Either they're short-sighted and they really aren't out to fulfill the Great Commission, or worse, they're selfish. And they want the title and all of the respect that goes along with that. And in order to make them feel big, they'll keep you small. And they'll keep you on the hamster wheel. And they'll run you as hard as they can until you die. But at the end of the day, they're not moving you towards a goal. Our goal, please hear me, I'm gonna wrap up with this, is to move everybody who calls this your church home. If you become a member of Two Cities Church, our goal is to move every member to become a leader. We don't think this is an option. We believe this is what Jesus called all of his people to do. And every one of us in this room can do this with somebody. All of us can. We're going to take the Lord's Supper together. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you to put this week, maybe put right now, something that you've heard from this sermon into practice. Maybe some of you are saying, and I'm not on a path for leadership. I don't even know that I am on my way to heaven. And maybe today what you need to do is you need to nail this one down once and for all. We're going to go from this sermon to a time of taking communion together as a church family. And this communion is for people that are already part of the family of God, which means you have bowed your knee and you have surrendered your soul to King Jesus. You've been faithful to follow him in baptism. And now he is inviting you to come and to participate in the Last Supper, that this juice that's in that cup and the little gluten-free bread that's on the, the table, it represents the holy, sinless Son of God whose body was broken and his blood was poured out so that my sins could be forgiven. That's why this thing is only for people who are already part of the family of God. And maybe this morning, you need to step across the line of faith and surrender your soul to Jesus. Maybe for some of you in this room, you need to say, hey, I can read some discussion questions. I can meet at a restaurant, and if that's you, we wanna encourage you, we wanna show you how you can do that. So maybe what you need to do after this service is over with is to talk to the folks at the welcome desk about leading a life group. But here's what everybody who claims the name of Jesus in this room can do. You can commit to having a lollipop leadership moment with one person. Maybe it's this week. 
Maybe it's this month, but I promise you, everybody in this room can do this with one person that doesn't know Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit steps in and he takes care of what happens after you've done this. Could you bow your heads? Let me pray for you. And during this prayer, would you start to prepare your heart for what we're going to do when we come to the Lord's table? Let's pray together. Father, I pray right now for people that are here in this room who need to step up and to start to leave. Maybe they've been treated like they're not important in your kingdom. And if that's the case, Father, would you help them to feel like this is a church that takes leadership really seriously? God, maybe you're calling somebody in this room to start leading a life group. And if that's the case, would you help them to let us know and we'll give them all of the resources that they need that we can provide for them to start this group. Would you cause all of us who know Jesus to do exactly what Paul said, to imitate Paul as he imitated you, Jesus? And would you cause us to be willing to do that? Maybe as simple as what Drew Dudley did when he handed a, a lollipop to a guy who eventually married the girl in this story today. Father, maybe somebody for the first time needs to step across the line of faith and they need to surrender their soul to Jesus Christ. If that's the case, I'm praying that right here, right now, for the first time, somebody turns to Jesus and prays a simple prayer of faith. It sounds something like this. Father, forgive me because I'm a sinner and I can't go to church enough. I can't be a good enough person for my sins to be forgiven. I, I believe that that's why you sent your son Jesus. That's why he was willing to leave heaven to come to earth. That's why he was willing to go to the cross and his body to be brutally beaten, his blood to be poured out so that my sins could be forgiven. And Father, right here, right now, this is just between me and you, for the first time in my life, turning from my sin, and I'm trusting Jesus, and you know I mean it. God, if somebody's making that commitment, would you give us the privilege of following up with them? Would you give us the privilege of helping them to understand what it means to be a Christian now that they've taken this first step? Holy Spirit, as we enter into a time of communion, what we're doing is we are looking back to what Jesus did for us on the cross. We're remembering him the way he commanded us to in the Bible, but we're also looking forward as Christians, to the meal that we will one day have in heaven when people from every tribe, every nation, every language, and every tongue sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb and we have a meal with you in heaven. So God, help us to look back and to reflect. Help us to look forward and rejoice at what's waiting for your people as they come forward and as they take communion this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.